we're all gathered here this evening in the midst of what we have all repeatedly uh, identified as one of the most unprecedented times in the in the time that we are all living uh, covid-19 has brought so many different aspects of our lives to a grinding halt to a standstill and has made us question several of our choices and has given us a lot of time to really introspect and uh, huddle and rethink at this moment uh, kriya university and lead of kriya of kriya university uh, who have been working together uh, with the support of ford foundation on a gender based violence project we were all sitting far apart and uh, we began wondering what happens to our project what happens and what do we do really and this project is still at the nascent stage from our end uh, but one thing that emerged out of all our discussions and the everyday news articles and data that were emerging and uh, meeting our view was that covid-19 or not gender based violence and violence against women and children is a far bigger reality that this world and this country in particular is facing this pandemic if anything has heightened that fear and that danger for all our women and children so we thought we must redirect ourselves a little bit in trying to understand where we place ourselves in this conversation and where better to begin than to have thus an invite on on board an eminent person who who describes indian women as a super generalization in her own words she says that there is no stable homogeneous category called the indian woman and we couldn't agree more because when we talk about gender based violence and especially gender based violence in public spaces or in various spaces one is constantly compelled to redefine what those spaces are who for whom those spaces are to be redefined and in what manner and who are these women and how do we really understand them and their needs so we are very happy to invite on board and to invite amidst us amla basin ji thank you so much for agreeing to be with us this evening uh, for the kriya university lead at kriya webinar the first in our series and uh, we couldn't have asked for a more befitting person to really open this dialogue for us thank you kamla ji before we give the floor to you you would be very appreciative to know that we have on board uh, a, a spirited team of folk artists who have joined us from tamil nadu from madras but they actually are in madras but right now they are stuck in perambalur uh, which is also part of madras uh, they are revolutionaries in their own way because they have uh, taken a folk very ancient folk tamil art like the parai which was stigmatized for many many years because of its caste affiliation and have brought in brought on board young people particularly women to learn and play the parai not in its stigmatized scenarios but in in public spaces to really take social causes and messages to people much like your own tremendous journey with folk arts and poetry uh, we are very happy to have the buddhar kalai guru they are right now very active on on youtube they have a channel of their own and they are promoting a lot of social messages particularly about the covid dangers through their parai and folk arts uh, mr mani maran who is um, the chief of this buddhar kalai guru who is right now uh, saying hello to all of us i welcome him and his small team he has a much larger team but he is here with us with a small contingent joined by his very talented wife magirini who is one of the first female parai artists and she is going to not just perform parai for us today but also she's she's planning to sing a song for us on none other than savitri bhai phule and they are calling their entire performance as the in fact their banner behind says valor celebrating the spirit and valor of savitri bhai phule so i think that's a befitting uh, beginning for all of us thank you so much uh, 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 manimaran ji and magirini ji and all your troop i think we begin there 
with the auspicious sounds of the parai and their dance, and then we move on to the webinar itself. Over to you, Mani Maranji. <coughs>
listening to the parai uh, even here people have gathered thanks to you people uh ipo naanga actually enga ooru vedandangal naanga ipo tarichamayum chennai la vaadagi veetla kudi irukrom my village town is vedandangal and uh, for time being we are in uh, chennai in a rented house chennai veedu chinnada போலாம் தான் திட்டமிட்டோம் ஆனா கஜா புயல்ல ஊர்ல இருக்கிற யோசிக்கும் பொழுதுதான் இங்க பெரம்பலூர் மாவட்டத்துக்கு நாங்க வர நேரிட்டது um uh, while we were thinking what to do we wanted to go back to vedantangal after this uh, covid lockdown but then uh, during gaja uh, 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 our uh, village hut had been uh, destroyed so we were thinking what to do and then we came here to a friend's place in perambalur district uh, to stay naanga irukkira idam vandu appingra oru tannarva thondu niruvanam so where 
we are saying uh, this place is called pyre it's a, uh, a community development organization adunudaiya priti varuvanga even this uh, of pyre is my priti avaru sendil ivarum inaindu da inda amai pa nadathranga so my partner is sendil and together we run a pyre organization pyre nudi da ivaru thambi aravin Uh, Aravind and Arjun are uh, kids from Payir. Uh, they stay here and uh, they are getting their education here at Payir. Nangge inge rikkar dalle. Idu madri ana nigar shigal inge ullur makarte monol vaya service engal WhatsApp oriya sila seidi gal pagiru badur kuriya arke. Staying here helps us in uh, two different ways. One is to keep ourselves safe and. Uh, Uh, the same way we are uh, getting a huge opportunity to use our arts to uh, reach out to people in the village and through facebook uh, uh, ulukku ammaakal teacher avae indha nerathila maaridano pondra seidhi ella naanga solli Uh, during this lockdown uh, we uh, we are spreading the news uh, such as like uh, uh, treating women they shouldn't be treated as bonded laborers but treated with dignity and respect ipo naanga pinnadi ezhudi irukrom celebr the valor spirit of avithi police avangala நினைக்கிறது ரொம்ப ரொம்ப பொருத்தமானது you would have seen that we have written uh, at the background that celebrating the valor and spirit of sabitri bai phule uh, during this covid period it's very important to remember people like sabitri bai phule 1897 ல பிளேக் நோயால மக்கள் கடுமையான அவதிக்குள்ளாக Uh, during 1897 uh, people were uh, uh, affected hugely by plague epidemic paniyat phule andanoi totti erpattu savitri bai phule came forward to help people who were affected uh, in plague during the epidemic and then she herself got infected and she had to lose her life helping others iniki ulagame adangi ponaalum aadikam aanaadikam during this lock even every, uh, in the whole world so many things have been uh, so, so many things have come down but certain uh, the violence against women kudumba vanmuriye patti pesra indha neram சாவித்ரி பாய் பூலே ஜோதிராவ் பூலே இவங்க ரெண்டு பேரும் ஒரு குடும்பத்தினுடைய தலைமை எப்படி இருக்கு முன்னுதாரணமா carry this uh, family relationship police madri nariya pen aalumaigal india mulukka aadikkathukku edhira samathuv aadarava uyi panaiyum vaithu odachirukkaranga like like them so many others have uh, worked really hard uh, and they have uh, given a uh, lot of importance in uh, uh, establishing equality worldwide appadiyana pen aalumaigalai patri niraivu paadal so many leaders have been contributing for this cause and one such song mahilini is going to sing about women leaders inga nalla vishayam da ikkai namakku odavuranga malai thambi neenga kitta vandirunga malai thodangi irukke adanal kondu porama nenne andha paadala paadikkrom is a very good uh, nature is helping us uh, started raining here 
so we are uh, let, moving a little bit back and then we are going to start the uh, song மணிமாறன் Uh, team who have who have given us a wonderful fulfilling beginning all those of you who've been sharing your um, joy in having witnessed this beautiful art form which i have i've shared a little bit of history about this for those of you who are interested in the comments box uh, parai parai form is is one of the most ancient forms which was deeply stigmatized because of um, uh, of uh, with along with the caste and uh, the the various kinds of uh, oppression and uh, mr manimaran is one of the pioneers who had brought it back and uh, reinstated it on other platforms other than funeral processions where it was meant to be performed and or relegated to be performed we are very happy that he was joined by his wife i think it was a brilliant beginning to us thank you very much and um, on the note where he had sung that beautiful magalini had sung that beautiful folk song for us about the various women who have contributed to the long history of of thinking about women really i mean uh, i think the society at several levels forgets to think about women as a very important entity either we deify them or we live or we vilify them but it took an entire tradition of women from starting from savitri bai phule as he had beautifully uh, sung in the song to so many others uh, in this long tradition of women who who stood up for us who spoke for us and who have who have allowed us dignity in our lives and uh, what more uh, befitting than to have one such woman amidst us this evening uh, a pioneer one must say 
a path breaker. I say path breaker because feminist theories were long there. But someone who took those theories, who broke it down and took it to the common man, who took it to the every to, to, who took it to every person out there, and who took it not as theories, but broke it down into songs, into poetry, into storytelling, into narratives that young people and the common people could latch on to and to, to engage their imagination and engage them in conversations that were very, very important and to appeal to their conscience. Um, a woman who is feisty, who is known for her non mincing of words, somebody who is just uh, a, a ground activist, something that she is very proud of and something that we are all very thankful for, who has influenced generations of activists and grassroots workers in their own parts. Um, she lives, she walks her talk. And I think that's one of the greatest uh, compliments I think one can have in their lifetime because it's so difficult for many people to walk their talk. Here we have Kamla Basinji. We're very, very happy. I, I'm giving no introduction to her to her talk because I think she will frame it for us. Our, our interest, as I have already placed it here, is to really understand where we are, what it is that we have to, at this point, stop and rethink and reevaluate. What are these social norms? What are we to do with it? What are we, how are we to process and uh, really respond in what ways to gender-based violence and particularly in the public space, but generally gender-based violence and this pandemic has somehow given us that, that impetus to also think in that uh, in, a, in a much more deeper sense. Um, we will take questions from all of you who are participating in this webinar. We would, we would request you to keep, a, keep your questions concise and type it out in the comments box. We will take as many questions as we can after Kamla Ji finishes her uh, lecture. Over to you, Kamla Ji. Thank you very much and welcome to Kriya University and lead at Kriya. As, as I was just saying, LEAD is a research organization and Korea University looks at educating the young in uh, to really face the 21st century with uh, all its unprecedentedness. And this moment could not have been more unprecedented for us in that sense. Thank you very much for joining us. Over to you. Say Nandari, Jai Savitribai Phule and Fatima Sheikh. Long live the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Long live the Indian Constitution. And loving greetings to everyone who is listening. Friends, first of all, just to let you know that I am not an academic. I am an activist who has spent about 40 years on organizing and conducting short courses for activists and bringing activists together, doing networking between them at the Asian level. So as you know, I've been asked to speak about mitigating rising gender-based violence amid COVID-19 and beyond. Let me begin with COVID-19. We humans are locked in, very unhappy. But I think Mother Nature is very happy with COVID-19. I think the rivers and the air and the ponds are much cleaner already. The air, even in Delhi, is much cleaner. The animals are claiming their spaces which had been denied to them by us humans. So I think minus us, all other beings are quite happy with us locked in because we have locked them in now for centuries. Now friends, like all dangers, COVID-19 is also bringing out whatever is in inside each one of us. If we have love inside, if we have compassion inside, then in situations of danger, it comes out. Today, you can see thousands of people 
at the risk of their own lives, taking care of others, providing health care, providing food, providing love, providing hope. All over the world, thousands. But then those who have hatred in their hearts, that is coming out. It's coming out in a big way. They're calling people names. They're abusing others. They're holding other people responsible. And recently, the UN Secretary General said yesterday that there is a pandemic of violation of human rights today. So this is what is happening. Friends, COVID-19 is like a mirror. Actually, I think, no, it's, it's like a magnifying glass. I think COVID-99 is magnifying all the fault lines, all the weaknesses in our societies. It is showing the great inequalities which persist all over. I mean, India, after 70 years, today you can see the inequalities. It is showing how the system is working for people like me, the privileged. Our children were brought in flights from all over the world. We were brought from all over the world. But the workers, the daily wage workers, the migrant workers were said, no, you can't move. And we give you no notice. Not one day, not two days, not three days, zero. You live here, you, know? you are animals, you are not human beings. So one can see that. I belong to the privileged class. And I think most of you listening to me belong to that class. We are okay. We are sitting in our comfortable homes with our technology, connected with the world, continuing our intellectual exercises. What about those in tiny rooms, six, eight, ten, without food, without their own toilets, without water, without jobs, without money, without hope? So, I mean, very, very sad. COVID-19 is telling us some truths also. Simple truths. There's only one earth and it belongs to all of us. We are interconnected. In China, but it can be in Scandinavia within a week. It can be in America within a week. So we either survive together or we go down together. It's up to us. To me, COVID-19 has been saying equality is better for all. Inclusion, living in harmony, is better for all. I feel COVID-19 has become such a huge issue because it was the privileged who got it first and who spread it all over the world. And we are talking so much about COVID-19 because the, a royal family guy can get it, a prime minister can get it, Hollywood and Bollywood stars can get it. Plus, it is affecting big business. That's why we are talking about it, not because it's the most dangerous thing. As a woman, I can tell you that a billion women face violence in so-called normal times. How many? A billion. One out of three women. In so-called normal times, in India, three lakh farmers commit suicide. COVID-19 has killed less than 10,000. Three lakh farmers. Did we shout so much about it? No. 
Around 9 million people in India die of malnutrition every year. How many? 9 million. In India, where women are worshipped, 63 million women are missing. They have either not been allowed to be born, or they are killed after they are born. 63 million. The population of Bhutan is half a million. The population of Maldives is half a million. And we have done away with 63 million women in normal times, not COVID-19. So friends, COVID-19 is helping me see very clearly that there are some other deadly viruses like patriarchy, like caste, like class, race, heteronormativity, viruses homegrown, viruses developed over centuries, the virus of privatization, getting into medicine and education, making it unaffordable for the poor. And you in Korea University should know this. Who can afford health today? Who can afford education today? And they becoming carriers of inequality. And we can also see, friends, that countries which tried to reduce inequalities are dealing with COVID-19 much better. The Scandinavian countries. You can also see that leaders who have love and compassion in their hearts are doing much better. And yes, I'm talking of the six women heads of states about whom so many articles are coming out. So actually, COVID-19 is really an amazing mirror to us human beings. I feel we need effective soaps and sanitizers of human rights, equality, compassion, and love to kill the viruses of patriarchy caste, and in Tamil Nadu, you people should know caste very well, class, race. And I think we need to identify and quarantine people who are infected by these viruses. And we really need to block them in, lock them in, and save humanity. And I think COVID-19 is giving us that opportunity. And now to the other part of this talk, gender-based violence. I call it by a more straightforward name, patriarchal violence. That gender bender, it hides everything. Gender-based violence. You know, it's a, it's a university term. Patriarchy is a struggle term. Patriarchy is a movement term which names the real thing. Because gender-based violence can be done by women. And we know how much of it is done by women and how much is done by men. Right? Patriarchal violence not only on women, on gentlemen, gentle boys, transgenders, homosexuals, there is an increase in all these groups. And these facts are coming out. Reports are coming out from many, many countries about this. The National Commission of Women has spoken. UN Secretary General has spoken, UN Women has spoken. And friends, some decent people, they cannot believe that 
when human beings are facing death from a virus, they would be violent towards their own women, their own partners, and really decent people shouldn't be able to believe. How can it happen? And friends, these days, homes where this violence is taking place, they're not just providing food and a bed and sex to people. Homes today are schools, colleges, universities. Homes today are functioning as offices. Homes today are production centers. Who is running them? Women. Plus, hospitals, the nurses, maybe there's one doctor and 10, 10 to 15 nurses after, you know, to a doctor. So women are on the front line of saving humanity. And what are we doing to them? What are we giving to them in return? Violence. I mean, it is unimaginable. I mean, even during COVID-19, women are producing babies, they're con conceiving babies. And return for all this is violence, insult, fear. To people like me, we expected this to happen. And it was obvious. Because we have history. We have data from the past that the virus of masculinity, the virus of patriarchy thrives during emergencies like this. It happens during wars. It happens during religious conflicts all the time. Full men become more violent. Desperate men become more oppressive, controlling, Horrible. During lockdowns, these poor, violent men don't know what to do with their pent up frustrations. The pubs are closed, the red light areas are closed, there's no cinema, there are no restaurants, there are no football. I mean, in Europe, no football. Poor guy, what does he do with his machismo? No cricket in India and South Asia. No World Wrestling Federation. No Kabaddi. All that took away their violence. No release. Plus, these poor people are unemployed. They are no more breadwinners. Plus, they see no future. They see no hope. What do they do? They beat up their wives, their living partners, their children. Now you can ask me, why do men do this? Why don't women do this? Because we are facing much worse than men. Why don't we do it? And I'm not saying no woman does it. I would say maximum of 5%. 95% gender-based violence is men's violence against women. And in their violence, their mothers and all that can be supported. Okay? Why do men do it? Because this is what they have been taught since the day they were born. This is what patriarchy taught them. They are told that they are superior to their sisters, to all women. They are told they will inherit the family property, the family name. So even 250 years after democracy in America, you hear names like Kennedy Senior, Kennedy Junior, Bush Senior, Bush Junior. Not a single daughter has ever been called Bush Junior or Kennedy Junior. We have no names, we have no homes, we have no businesses. These boys are told they'll be sent to better schools, they'll be given better health, 
facilities, they will be given better food. And they're told they don't have to do household work. They don't have to serve others. They're lord and masters. When they get married in India, they get Kanya Daan. A girl, a woman is given to them in Dana, a donation by another man. And what do they do? Lest the woman go astray, they put Tali in their neck. They put Sindur. This is my woman, my property, not for sale anymore. And that that woman would be an MBA, would be a PhD, changes her name the next day. She becomes the wife of Mr. So-and-so. In Hindi, he is called Pati Parameshwara. In Bangla, he is called Swami. Lord and Master, both words. In English, he is called husband, which means, by the way, I'm sure you know that the word husband is the same as the word in animal husbandry. Controller, manager. One word in our languages, which one word, it's not even part of the definition of marriage. Why are we surprised when he hits us? Lords and masters do hit for goodness sake. This is what he has been taught by his religion. In all religions, God is referred to as he. If God is he, then he is God. If God is he, then he is God. So why will he not beat his wife for goodness sake? I mean, whom else will he beat? So I can go on and on and on. But I think you've got the point. Patriarchy is not an exception and this is a global system. That is why the president of a country can speak about women the way he does, Mr. Trump. That is why our ministers can say whatever they like about women. Earlier, only religions and culture spread this nonsense. Today, modern capitalist patriarchy is spreading masculinity and femininity. They today are creating these gender stereotypes. Our Hollywood and Bollywood films, billion dollar industries, creating these images of macho men, Godfather 1, Godfather 2, Don 1, Don 2, Don 3, the bunk, the mees. What are they doing? Macho figures. The, on the other side, on the other side, those women undressing at any occasion and every occasion. Pornography in capitalist patriarchy, a billion dollar industry available in your phone, in your pocket. Toy industry, guns for the boys, Barbie dolls for the girls. And then the big billion dollar industry of uh, trafficking of women. Providing women of all kinds, all cultures, all colors, all sizes to men all over the world. So friends, this is what it is. So it's very difficult for boys and men. They have to be exceptional to escape patriarchy. And of course, boys and men are not born violent. They are born human beings. But this horrible training starts the moment they get out. Why does patriarchy continue for 3,000 years? Because it is very useful for society. Today, it is very useful for industry. Women provide free care. They produce children free of cost for the industry. 
1995, UN did a report on gender and they calculated and said that if we were to give minimum wages for women's unpaid care work at home, what value will we give at minimum wages? The figure was $11 trillion annually. Today, after 25 years, you could perhaps double that figure with the trillion dollars. And what do you say? Oh, no, no, madam. My wife, ma'am, she's just a housewife. She doesn't work. Brother, $11 trillion is what these so-called housewives contribute to you. So, and for contributing $11 trillion, a billion of us are violated. Your topic says mitigating gender-based violence. I wasn't sure what the word mitigating meant actually, so I googled. And it says reducing the extent, making it more tolerable. So I am not happy with mitigating gender-based violence. I will only be happy as a feminist with eliminating, not mitigating, enough of that kind of thing, and eliminating it from within our hearts, from within our minds, from within our cultures. Cultures should not be spreading violence. Religions should not be spreading violence. They, they should be spreading love. But because violence is part of patriarchy, it is not an accident in patriarchy. Patriarchy will not continue if there was no violence, like caste system will not continue without caste violence. So patriarchy may, violence is systemic, it is structural. So we cannot eliminate violence without eliminating patriarchy. And because patriarchy and caste and class and race are interlinked, our efforts have to be intersectional. We can't just fight patriarchy alone. It is kept going by caste and class and race. So I'm afraid there are no shortcuts. And we have been trying to do this for over 300 years. And we will continue to do this. Unfortunately, if we fight it, the whole of capitalist patriarchy is there to spread it. The entire industries are there to spread it. And friends, I really feel that we people don't have to do big things anymore. Big things have been done by the UN. We have the Universal Declaration. Big things have been done by the Indian Constitution. They have said all human beings are born free and equal with dignity and rights. So it is our legal right. Who is not giving us these rights? We the people. We the people are not accepting that all human beings are equal. Dalits are equal, that women are equal, that transgenders are equal. So I believe it is we, the people. And now, friends, my almost my last point. We women have been fighting patriarchy for a long time. The time has come for men and boys to understand how patriarchy is hurting them. Yes, it is giving them privileges. Yes, it is giving them properties and positions and everything. But my God, what is it taking away from them? It is taking away their humanity, their beauty, their love. A 
ability to nurture human beings. If you lose your humanity, then what's the point of you having all these positions? Men have to realize that unless women are free, they cannot be free because they are connected to women. Woman, his mother, woman, his sister, woman, his wife, woman, his friend, woman, his daughter. If they are not free, he will spend all protecting them, beating them. So without women's freedom, men cannot be free. Men need to understand that gender equality is not a zero-sum game. If women become equal, men will not lose. Gender equality is a win-win game. If I become strong, I can tell my brother, hey, bro, you want to do music? You go do music. I'll look after the business. I'll become a lawyer for my father. Bro, you want to dance? You want to be transgender, bro? Go. I am there, no? Similarly, a partner telling her husband, don't worry if you fall sick. I am there, man. You don't have to do it all for us. That is my feminism, where we take rights after we do our duties. That's what my dream is. How do men and boys become gentle and caring? I think the only way is for them to start doing household work, for them to serve other people, for them to put the need of another person before their need. Somebody is hungry for their, somebody's thirst like women do, staying up whole night because a child is not able to sleep. The women are not born better than men. No way. And we see how horrible women can be to other women. I mean, we all know that. But we do become a little more gentle because for thousands of years, we create a new person. And unfortunately, Men don't have proper bodies to create children. I mean, all right, I feel bad for that. It's okay. But my God, nothing stops you from holding them, giving them a bottle. Your breasts are useless. You don't have them. Never mind. You can use a bottle, man. And just as I learned how to clean shit of my children, I didn't know before they were born. I was 33 when I first time cleaned somebody's bottom. When I could learn it at 33. My man also learned it at 33 or 35. I feel this is the only way men can realize their beauty, their humanity, their love. The other thing is boys and men have to share property with women. And then we can all walk ahead, COVID or no COVID. If we had done all this, there will be no more violence in COVID. It's there because we do it all the time. So friends, I believe the changes will have to begin within us. I don't look at the state and say, state do this, state do that, state do that. Because people who run the state also come from the same families. Mr. Trump has come from a family. The other macho leaders come from the families. The policeman whom you see beating people most of the time. I feel so sad in COVID-19. The police is beating the poor all the time. Where do they come from? And when a woman goes to the policeman, how he treats her, where does he come from? So we begin with ourselves. It's a long-term solution. And of course, for short-term solutions, we can talk about it. But I will stop now. I have some tea while you 
get your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Kamla ji. I think, I think my introduction of calling you a feisty woman, I think that that is an understatement. I just got a message from one of my colleagues calling you a rock star, and that's what you are. <laughs> Can I put a pagri on here? I think you should. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for really giving us a head start on all of this. I mean, uh, you have you have really brought this this issue head on to each one of us. You have dismantled the onus from institutions, from dispensations, and brought it directly to each one of us. Um, and I think and I think that really rings true because. Today, the environment has changed. COVID has not just changed the lives of people, but as you rightly began, it has changed the environment and it's perhaps changed it for good in very, in many, many different ways. Uh, so, in your opinion, are we going to be re-inhabiting a different sort of environment, a different kind of world going forward? Is there a possibility? You, you, you did end by talking about some of the things that um, particularly men and boys can begin doing, for example, Household chores. I mean, I think COVID nineteen has made that a reality, in, at least in certain homes where people are now sharing some of their household responsibilities, etc. I don't know if that's bringing about um, a change in them, so to speak, in in order to become more um, empathetic and caring towards others. But do we have an opportunity here that we should harness to really look at some sort of a change in norms in this in the society that we live in, the ones that we inhabit? definitely have an opportunity but whether we will do it my doubts that one percent or say three percent to which we belong the people who go to Kriya university we belong i don't know we are whether we are capable of that entire rethinking i believe other than gender, which is connected to the economy and to the politics, we really need to go, go back to nationalization of basic service. Most of the governments have spent time breaking these systems in India. What have we done in the last 20 years of globalization, of liberalization? And when I went to school, there were only government schools. So the inequality was not increasing. But today, these universities costing a lakh a month, 50,000 a month, and increasing the inequalities. When I was growing up 74 years ago, there were only government hospitals. We all went to the same. And because the minister went to the same and the IAS fellow went to the same, they function. They delivered. Today they don't have to deliver because we don't go there anymore. 20 years ago, we all had Indian postal service. In one rupee, my letter would reach Chennai, Madras then. In one day. Today I pay 35 rupees for a courier. Everything privatized. So I feel profit motive cannot remain the driving force of our lives. Caring, nurturing, welfare, that has to be paramount. Do you really think? people will be able to change do you really think our governments can do away with their controls who controls our governments so and if we don't do it now we will never do it and i think some gov some countries in europe will do it and they have been doing it, like Scandinavia. Some countries in our neighborhood, like Bhutan, gross national happiness, 
not gross national product. So I think our hearts have to have more love and compassion. I feel profit-based capitalism should be out. But today all our universities are based on that. Everything is based on that. So I don't know. But I won't be there anyway. So you chaps deal with it. <laughs> yes. to... on. Yes. No, we hope not. We need you. <laughs> I will be on. Uh, Kamala ji, I'll move between a couple of my questions and then some of the questions that are coming in. Um, I'd like to read out a question by, from one of our students, from the first year's undergrad student. Her name is Mitra. And uh, she and says, Hello, Mit Mitra. Mitra, oh, friend. Yes. So she says, hello, ma'am. As a woman, most, um, most or to be honest, almost all the women in our society live in constant terror of being prone to abuse, both physical and mental. How do you think patriarchy has affected the mindsets of the younger generation? And how do you think society can change the younger minds for a better future? Mitra, society will change when you and I change. You are absolutely right. We, every woman lives either with violence or the fear of violence. I have never been raped. But have I ever been without the fear of rape? Have I ever taken a taxi in any city of the world without once thinking Will I reach my destination? And if I carry this fear with me all the time, can I ever achieve what I born to achieve? And I feel so bad that patriarchy makes me suspect every man on the road. Patriarchy makes me suspect every taxi drivers that poor guy didn't even think of raping me but my god if two percent men do it how do i know this fellow is not from those two percent so i totally agree with you mitra and i think we need to just begin with ourselves and we need to begin with our homes we need to begin with our little brothers and the boys we go to school with or the boys you go to university with, talk to them about these issues. Stop being that typical girl. You know, there's an amazing book written by a woman called Deepa Narayan, where she has studied women, upper class women, and she finds that all of them are also so patriarchal. You know, getting an MBA or getting a fancy degree from Kriya University does not kill the virus of patriarchy. So we have to take risks. We have to go out. We have to do it. We have to spread the sanitizers of equality and love. Begin with ourselves. Thank you very much. Um, Kamala ji, in your vast experience with the grassroots, particularly with women from the rural, and also, you know, you work a tremendous lot with women from the cities. I mean, you brought to us the realities of our own existence here in the, in the past half an hour. Uh, what do you think is perhaps a distinguishing uh, factor between the way violence is processed and responded to in the rural space and in the urban space? So, Mali, I don't think it is rural or urban it is your class mm. the brahmin upper class woman in the rural will behave the same way as the brahmin upper class in the urban mm. if you are a working class woman your husband cannot lock you down you can't earn enough for the whole family. So 
a working class woman is much more mobile. She is much less covered. She is much less in parda. Yeah. She bloody well earns. And if she earns, she never feels as desperate and helpless yeah. as an upper class woman does. What would she do after a divorce? in her background a woman has ever stood on her legs I am now a working woman but I'm the first generation so-called working woman outside my mother wasn't my grandmother wasn't so it's not yet my sense of fearlessness is not rooted yet the working class woman who comes to your house to clean your utensils, her mother was a working woman, her grandmother, her grandmother. So if her husband does nonsense, there is a possibility that she'll say, yeah. get off. And she'll come out and say, the bastard is hitting me. How many middle class women will come out calling their man by this word? They will hide it, they will powder it, they will put dark glasses, etc. etc. But patriarchy is spreading even into those classes now. Like dowry was never existing among the really poor. So instead of equality coming up, patriarchy is going there. Dowry is going there. And even there now, they are killing their daughters. So, I mean, for example, Adivasi women, tribal women, indigenous women, much stronger, much less gender inequality. Class inequality, yes. Much less gender inequality. Much more. Just to see the way they stand. Their body language and see our body language. How we stand and how they stand and how they climb a tree and deal with things. You can see it in their bodies. You can speak, see it in their speech. So nothing to do with rural and urban, according to me. Right. Um, thank you so much. I, there, here's another question from uh, one of our uh, attendees. I'm just going to read it out. I don't have the attendee's name here, but uh, I'll just read out the question. In the context of the lockdown, confined spaces are definitely perpetrating violence, physical, uh, physical. Social distancing is a privilege for people with space. How helpful are helplines in this situation, especially now since the number of calls have increased on these helplines? How does it affect men? What about those who cannot access these helplines? It is a scary scenario to know what they would be going through. Okay, this question is helping me to talk about what can we do in the short run, which is during COVID-19. This is what she's asking. He or he, I don't yeah. know. Yeah. First of all, let's talk more and more about violence during this time. Make it a national priority. Unfortunately, I have not heard our Prime Minister mention domestic violence as one of the issues. Or any government authority mention this issue. I think they need to say it. Number two, they need to say that supporting the victims of domestic violence is part of essential services. Just as Hospitals are part of essential services. This is part of essential services. I feel just as we have created this vast social media campaign about wash your hands like this 22 seconds, such media campaigns and say shame on you if you do it. Number four, in England, they have started taking men out to jails. On an average, they are taking 100 men out in a tiny country like England. 100 a day. 
in other European countries, they are saying women and children will not be taken to to to, to shelters. Be men taken away from those homes. So these kinds of things as can be done. And just as we have made very strict rules against violence against health workers and doctors, we can make the domestic violence rules more effective. Catch them the same day, put them in, and we'll deal with them after COVID-19. Quarantine these viruses, the patriarchal virus, quarantine them. So the other thing I think neighbors can play a very important role. We can keep our eyes and ears and hearts open to see. I have read that in some countries, since women can't reach the police, they are going to chemists. And code words have been created so that the chemist knows she's talking about domestic violence. And in India, we have also seen that women can't even call. So the National Commission of Women says they're sending their reports by email, some of them. But how many women have emails? How many women have access to all that? It's a difficult situation, but I think neighbors can do much more. The government can do much more by, you know, I mean, if every day, 10 times the television says no violence, the children will look at their father who's doing it. The message will get there. And the fellow will know. And if he knows that one phone call and he will be taken out. So these are the four or five things which can be done. And I hope in the next Man Ki Baat, our Prime Minister talks, Hamare Man Ki Baat Bhi. And he says what's bugging us. And they need to talk about it. I mean, none of them I have heard has mentioned domestic violence. They don't mention it when 63 million women have died. I'm not surprised. Three million women. I mean, Hitler killed six million Jews. We, who worship women, goddess Kali, goddess this, goddess that, 63 million. By whom? By well off, educated families, much more who helped well-off doctors coming out of our university, well-off technicians coming out of our universities. So when people say education is a solution of all, I wish it was true. At times I feel educated people are the problem. Most corrupt, most polluting, most consuming, most waste producing. So, Kamla ji, I just want to also sort of, uh, you know, the other thing is, we, I mean, we're all using the digital space today to uh, to talk about various things, and right now we are connected because of the digital. No, no. By the way, not all, maybe 5% of India. Yes. Yeah, I meant all of us today who are connected on this yeah, phone. Yeah. And Please. the privileged class, as you as yeah, you yeah. Absolutely. Uh, but the truth also remains that now the digital space has enabled, along with the ability to communicate within a particular section of people, also the, the danger, the imminent danger of uh, violence perpetrated in that space. Uh, there is also a lot of information now coming out, talking about the, the various Zoom. Uh, today, somebody, my sister was telling me about the Zoom bloopers, where young boys and men uh, send naked pictures to their teachers and tutors on Zoom, etc., and have funny, sometimes very misogynistic names for their uh, accounts, etc., etc. So it's very disturbing, this space. So in your uh, recent experiences with the digital, um, have you come across, have you identified how we can 
really possibly identify gender based violence in the digital space and how we can sort of deal with it no i mean we've known it from the beginning that these things are double edged swords they can help but they can also worsen and we have known it forever i mean technology has no value technology has no morality like education sadly doesn't have value or morality anymore it should have had but it doesn't so and who controls it the powerful control it so the powerful will use it for themselves and today the digital world basically is being used to do away with our human rights to do away with our privacy all the threats which we are facing today because of this technology and we are letting it go because and they are happy to i mean covid-19 has a, has come as a godsend to them to take away all our rights all the human rights which we have fought for they are now taking anybody and everybody who was fighting for human rights and putting them in jail nothing can be done so you know when i was growing up we had this word called appropriate technology mm. there we said any technology which the poor can appropriate is appropriate appropriate is who appropriates it right who, con who controls it that is it any technology can be appropriate if we control it but by the time you are on 2g the others are on 5g what are they doing they are becoming billionaires and out of those billions they give 1% and become the biggest philanthropists i say my god don't exploit people so much then we don't need your bloody money <laughs> thank you thank you for that. uh here's a question from maitri modi one of our students um, again from the uh, sias of kriya hello ma'am i was just wondering when uh, when you talk about quarantining the patriarchal violence in a in a, in a way uh, aren't we dependent on them because of our dependency can we actually quarantine them although it is sad to say this uh, i'm just thinking out loud if you want you can reframe this question oh i think that's to me i think she i think her question is the patriarchal violence as in the the sorry i did i did i was am i am i audible yeah. patriarchal viruses that you spoke about so her question is aren't they sort of have they have they not sort of become such an essential part of our existence that you know she's wondering if uh, i mean what it is that we can really do i mean how dependent are we on on uh, i think what she means is culturally three three i mean why are women only dependent on men i mean men are dependent on women for every essential service so i think they are mutually dependent we are interdependent and if we are interdependent then why should any one of us do violence to the other and i think we need to internalize people i mean who could say that Six weeks ago, could we say that we could live in one flat for so many days? So we get rid of these things that we can't do it. We can't get rid of violence. I mean, you have the constitution. We have the constitution on our side, human rights on our side. But we upper class women, you know, we don't want to leave our class privileges. we won't leave these men with their cars and th those are the kind of men we want to marry after fancy degrees so i think we need to see whether we value dignity more than a big car that we value self respect and creativity we have come to this world to do something great 
we haven't come here to be chained with jewelry of all kinds and violence of all kinds and bandish kinds this is not why we are we were brought to this world and we are all interdependent and that is how it should be defined that's what i feel and i really feel that no human being no dalit no woman no transgender should be facing any violence and i feel no human being should have a heart like that that he he or she can do this violence i mean i honestly but i honestly worry for people who live with hate in their hearts i don't want to see their hearts what they look like with violence i mean and where do they get time for violence where do they get time for hatred i don't have enough time for love thank you so much kamla ji i think i'll make this the last question and this is from kishor venkat uh, sorry i yes he says uh, dear ma'am i think the concept of sex and gender are seen as culturally constructed rather than biological using the discourses of caste class and gender norms how do you think we can separate this understanding of cultural norm of culture cultural norms from biological in terms of gender hello venkat sandare i believe i mean sex is biological and gender is socio economic and cultural religious i believe biology has made us different has made venkat and me different but what is the difference between venkat and kamla only two or three things are different the poor venkat has no proper breasts which can deliver milk now venkat doesn't have a uterus now it's sad but he doesn't have it so the difference between venkat and kamla is only that nature has given him more power and more responsibility and i'm very happy with that i'm willing to perform this because it's very creative it is lovely so as far as nature is concerned she made us different only for reproduction that is the only reason and for reproduction we have to cooperate not beat each other we have to cooperate otherwise no reproduction man i believe not i believe i know nature does not make anybody unequal superior inferior nature makes us different not unequal society makes us unequal men are superior brahmins are superior fair people are superior all men are superior not nature nature has never said that black people are inferior nature has never said that rose is more beautiful than any other flower that elephant is superior to a mouse no mouse is mouse elephant is elephant all have their place so all inequalities have been created by us which means that if we want it we can dream inequalities we can be not mitigators destroyers and in it that's what i believe not i believe i Thank you. i know Thank you so much, Kamla ji. So many more questions pouring in from students and uh, all our attendees. 
Um, I just want to say that we are running out of time and so we may not be able to take all your questions. For example, there is um, Ashish Bastia who's asked, what can MBA students and students in general, how can they be part of this, you know, the, 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 the solution that we can bring about towards annihilating violence? Um, I don't know if we have the time to take that question. Would you would you like to give a quick answer to Ashley? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know where he goes, but he can come today and book for his mother and his sister. He doesn't need an Aadhaar card. He doesn't need a passport or a ration card for doing this. We don't have to do big things. We don't need your MBA degrees to help us. We need your love. We need your care. We want your promise that you will never harass a woman that you will never look at her badly and you will not allow another man to do it. No MBA, a good heart, my man, just a good heart and do it. And don't wait for tomorrow. Send a nice message to your mother, to your sister. Apologize to them if you lived off them, if you made them do all your work at home. Do it today. Don't wait, I'm telling you. Thank you so much. And he responds by saying, I started cooking. Thank you so much. I'm helping my mother with a smiley. Thank you for, for this very, you know, you, you have, you have really, like I said, put the yoke back on our shoulders and, you know, given us this mirror to reflect on. Thank you so much. I think this is in a large way. We will also start rethinking our own understanding of, uh, of how as an institution we can think of gender-based violence we have to start taking responsibility we have to be part of the part of the chain thank you very much for inspiring us and for being part of this evening can we end with two lines of your amazing poetry because that's something we cannot miss and then we'll call it an evening with that thank you so much. okay before that i just want to say happy ramzan to everybody to this country so many of our friends are fasting so we wish them and we learn from them and today I got a message from some friends that on May 1, many of us will fast in solidarity with the daily wage earners, with the migrant workers. So I invite all of you to fast on May 1. You can drink water, but try and not eat the whole day. I just want to, I'll finish with a positive poem. And of course, I don't write poetry in English. I write it in Hindi, Urdu. And I'm saying women are changing. So the Maitri and the Mitra who asked questions, it is dedicated to them. Hawaon si ban rahi hai ladkiyan. Hawaon si ban rahi hai ladkiyan. Unhe be khauf chalne mein maza aata hai. उन्हें मंजूर नहीं बेवजह रोका जाना परिंदों सी बन रही हैं लड़कियां becoming like birds परिंदों सी बन रही हैं लड़कियां उन्हें उड़ने में मजा आता है उन्हें मंजूर नहीं उनके परों का काटा जाना नहीं है लड़कियां उन्हें सर उठा जीने में मजा आता है मंजूर नहीं सर को झुका कर जीना और सूरज सी बन रही है लड़कियां उन्हें चमकने में मजा आता है उन्हें मंजूर नहीं हरदम फूलों से घिरा होना आई वॉन्ट एवरी गर्ल एंड एवरी बॉय एवरी ट्रांसजेंडर पर्सन realize their potential for which they are born and i just want to say that the fight for gender equality is not a fight between men and women mm -hmm. it's a fight between two ideologies one says patriarchy the other says no thank you equality and there are men and women on both sides thank you very much bye bye Thank you so very much on behalf of all of us this evening. People are pouring in their happiness and joy and, and they're tuning in from other parts of the world and thanking us for bringing you on this forum. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Kamlaji and Zindabad. Zindabad.